without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce Carrie. She is spends most of her time focusing on research for adolescent, child and adolescent depression and has um, developed a school-based prevention program called Positive Thoughts and Actions. She has uh, NIH and IMH grants and works with a very challenging middle school population, uh, Middle School Matters Study, and she's extensively published in academic journals such as Journal of Adolescent Health, Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, and the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So we're very pleased to have her here to give our lecture, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Carrie. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, school-based interventions for child and adolescent depression as well as some of my background research which has led me down this avenue and I wanted to start today with a little bit of epidemiology. Um, so you probably are aware that depression is quite common um, and it, in, that it's been said to be the most, um, have the most severe impact on functioning uh, for individuals because it's such a prevalent disease and it does bear a lot of burden. So if you look at the prevalence multiplied by sort of the impact, it creates a huge um, impact on people's functioning. Um, what we know about depression is that the hazard rate for the onset of depression, which is the time in life when it's most commonly going to begin, has been found to be sometime between mid to late adolescence. So that's important to me as a preventionist as I think about that. What that means to me is that we want to be doing prevention work before mid to late adolescence. Um, and it affects uh, approximately six million children and adolescents. Um, this is some data from the National Comorbidity Study um, Adolescent Supplement. And it reflects 13 to 17-year-old year populations experiencing major depressive disorder, dysthymic disorder, and or bipolar disorder. So bipolar is included in these slides. But as you can see, during this time frame, already the lifetime president prevalence of these mood disorders is up to 14%, with about 5% of the population experiencing a se severe mood disorder. Um, we do already see... Um, the gender difference in depression during this time frame, as well as age differences where, with increases in age, very similar to the information I suggested with the hazard rate. Um, depression is, uh, as I referenced before, it is a disease that has a lot of impact on functioning, and it is now considered a chronic disease. Even individuals who don't meet diagnostic criteria for a major depressive episode, those with sub-threshold symptoms, have been found to have lower functioning and for it to impact a lot of different areas of their life, their family life, uh, social life, as well as academic. So um, I think that for all of these reasons, depression is a really important problem for us to attend to um, and to be thinking about in terms of mental health. Um, it also increases risk for suicide, other psychiatric disorders, and substance use. Uh, the burden of depression for teens at its worst can result in suicide, which is, of course, a very uh, heartening problem. Um, bully side is kind of a new term that's being used because there has been a lot of media <coughs> attention to um, suicide that people believe is caused from the effects of suicide. So you can find new websites such as bullysuicides.com or bullyside.org that have been created to draw increased attention to these problems, telling the stories of these kids who have, um, who have in fact killed themselves as a result of bullying. So on the left we have Jared High who at age 13 committed suicide after being threatened by a peer and beat up. And on the right is Phoebe Prince, who took her life in 2010 in Massachusetts. After um, her peers insulted her, she went home and hung herself. And as a human being and a parent and a researcher, this is completely horrifying to me. And I think a lot of attention has been played to how do we decrease bullying, and that is very important and appropriate. At the same time, I think that we need to pay some attention to how do we build skills in kids 
to be able to handle the kinds of hassles that come up in their daily lives. And that has led me to be thinking about the kind of prevention work that we're doing in the school. So I believe that teaching kids um, social emotional skills is just as important as attending to some of their academic skills. And then in terms of um, suicide problems for the state locally, this does not reflect youth only, it includes adults. But you can see that um, the, the geographic distribution of uh, suicide is not equal and that there is a problem uh, more so on the west coast with all of the states except for California have it showing higher rates of suicide. We don't know why this is. It could be uh, due to um, these, some of these places having more rural populations, could be access to guns. I'm not sure what the reason is for this distribution, but I find it pretty interesting to know that um, we are at increased risk here in Washington State. So we have clear evidence that many youth are struggling with stress and depression, and this has been the basis for my research pathway, which sort of has two arms. And I'll start with the first arm, which is examining the contextual factors that contribute to youth um, development and mental health and that create propensity toward problems like depression. So my interest has been more so on modifiable factors uh, rather than intrinsic or genetic factors because of my interest in prevention. And so I'm going to show some of the paths that I've investigated in other research programs. We know that depression is multifaceted and that the causes are heterogeneous, um, so that they're, they cover a broad range of risk factors, not just one area. Uh, but some of the research I've done has looked at parental depression as a pathway toward youth depression, and I found that uh, parental social support is actually an important mediator of that relationship. Um, I've also done some research on cognitive styles, thinking styles, and found a number of cognitive styles, like other researchers, that are associated with youth depression, so those are very important. And then um, stress and support, kind of the ratio of stress and support appears to be important in predicting depression, so youth with a lot more stressful events and daily hassles and low levels of support are at particular risk for depression. And finally, um, school failure, having problems and difficulties in school, things like um, getting suspended, expelled, not graduating, appears to be at risk for depression, particularly for girls in the paper that, um, that we looked at school failure as a risk for depression. We found a gender moderation effect. And here are some of the references for this work. So this is not a complete model, but it does start to show some of the important pathways and factors to consider um, as we think about intervention. <coughs> so the second branch of my work examines what we know about treatment effects to intervene for depression. And I'm going to show you some aspects of this work next. Um, I published a review paper examining what do we know about family risk factors for youth depression and how much families have been included in treatment studies so far. And what the literature has shown is that consistently there's a number of family risk factors that are involved in depression. And these factors include parental depression, the family climate, um, parental cognitive style even. However, Mostly, the research that we've done looking at effects of treatment for youth depression have not included families. Only 32% of the studies included parents in some fashion in their intervention. So the bulk of what we've been studying in terms of intervention effects is really, um, I think it's, it's come down from the adult model, which is you work with the depressed patient alone in a vacuum, you do your work, they're not, you know, you need to activate their behavior, you need to change their cognition, but there's been really very little attention to the context, and I think this is really important, um, particularly the younger you go in thinking about this. If you're just trying to change the child without any attention to the environment, it's going to be much harder to affect change. So, um, I think we need more work, including parents. Um, 
here we see a graph that shows the effect sizes using a standardized benchmark to measure the outcome after depression treatment. So we did a, a meta-analysis of as many, all the trials we could find back in 2006 um, treating youth depression, and it was the most extensive meta-analysis at that time, and we found overall an effect size of 0.34. Um, so just to put that into context, people consider uh, 0.2 a benchmark for small effects and 0.5 a benchmark for medium-sized effects. 0.8 might be considered a large effect. So somewhere in between um, a small and a medium effect for depression. This is a little more sobering than previous studies have suggested for depression. Um, about 17 of these studies were using school-based samples. That's about half of the samples were school-based. So uh, it seems like we're having some impact on depression. It's not as huge as we had previously thought. Previous estimates had put it in the large range. Um, as a follow-up, I conducted a component analysis um, of the interventions that were effective. So looking at sort of creating a matrix, if you will, looking at the effective interventions and then laying out what they included to try to understand what are the active ingredients uh, for successful treatments for depression. Uh, this is sort of a la Torpedo style. It's kind of the same thing that he does when he creates his modular um, treatments. And this is what we found for the component analysis for evidence-based treatment for depression. The most common components of those effective treatments included these kinds of things. Goal setting, self-monitoring of depression, um, attention to relationships in some form. Now this would vary across treatments, but it could include like IPT, Laura Mufson's interpersonal therapy, which is a treatment for depression that specifically you can choose relationships as a focus of treatment and come to it every session thinking about your relationships, or it can be some other way that relationships were incorporated into the treatments. Um, the next level was cognitive restructuring, problem solving, and behavioral activation, those kind of standard, um, more cognitive and behavioral types of uh, interventions. And then um, other common components were child psychoeducation, teaching the child something about depression so that they could understand what this meant, um, as well as communication training, and most commonly that communication training, when it occurred, would be between the parent and the child when parents were included. So these are some of the common elements of different treatments across depression that appear to be uh, important, potentially. Um, so there are other good reasons for conducting depression uh, intervention in schools, such as that kids at risk for and with depression are not being detected in other settings, including primary care. Um, so we conducted a study, um, which is on this slide, with adolescents from group health, age 13 to 18, who were all insured, so they all had access to um, medical care. Uh, we compared youth with suicidal ideation to those without suicidal ideation, and we co-varied for depression. And we found that the youth with suicidal ideations, they had very high levels of functional impairment. Almost all of them, 85%, were in the definitely impaired range on the CIS, which is a measure of impairment. Um, they had higher levels of comorbidity, so they more commonly had things, especially externalizing problems, and substance use problems. However, only 26% of the youth with suicidal ideation um, received any mental health care in the previous year. And it's broken down here on the slide. 13% received outpatient mental health, 7% received antidepressants, and 12% received outside counseling and treatment. Of course, those numbers don't add up because there's overlap between kids who are getting multiple types of services. But th that means 74% aren't getting anything, and um, they're not being very well detected in the system as it currently stands. So um, I see this as a compelling reason to think about intervention in different venues, including schools. So um, the research in general suggested to me that we weren't doing nearly enough to involve the context, including parents, 
and that we needed to develop better and more robust intervention strategies. Um, so I wrote an NIHK award to develop and test a school-based prevention program for middle school youth, youth, and we've named the program Positive Thoughts and Actions. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the conceptual model underlying the intervention next so you can understand that. Any questions before I go to that? No? Just stretching? <laughs> Excellent. Um, so first, we, we recognize that there are multiple individual vulnerabilities that might create propensity toward depression. Um, so like other programs, we target those vulnerabilities that are modifiable. Um, youth are taught interpersonal skills, behavior activation, cognitive restructuring, emotion regulation, and problem solving, all in the first part of the intervention. And these skills are expected to attenuate the risk for depression. And we see this as a cognitive, behavioral, and interpersonal intervention with these skills. Um, and this is the first level of intervention. But our program also aims to create change for youth in their ability to influence the salient problems within the context that they're living. So we sort of have a specific focus to apply the skills that they're learning to these three target areas that we've identified that we think are particularly critical developmentally for middle school youth. One is parents and family. These are middle schoolers. They're living in a home with their parents. So we need to do something to help them have better relationships with their parents and family. Second is school. You know, they're, again, sort of the academic success link. They're on their way. And if they're having problems in school, this is the time to try to nip those in the bud rather than wait until they get much further down the line. And then the third is depression is such an interpersonal um, disease, I think, that you need to consider relationships more broadly speaking and for middle schoolers you know the peer relationships are becoming so very salient to them so we do try to attend to those and try to help them work through some of the conflicts that are arising uh, in those relationships and we do have kids in our many kids in our group who have been bully victims and are are struggling with that and trying to understand um, how to get through that Um, so we also added a family component, and uh, this is, I'll talk more about this in a few slides, but this is where we give parents an overview of the emotion regulation strategies, and we teach them empathy and communication skills as well. So um, that sort of rounds out our intervention. M much of it is delivered to the child, um, but not all of it, because we feel that we can make more headway when we have it being reinforced at home to the extent possible. So um, why should we be doing intervention in schools? Um, I see the schools as a really important place to do intervention for several reasons. One is you can consider the SEAL perspective, which is social, emotional, and academic learning. These three kinds of areas have been found to really mutually influence each other. And so if you can boost one area, you can find uh, links to increase skills in the other area. So I think that they're so well integrated that we really have to be thinking more broadly that academics is not a separate issue from social emotional learning, but it could, they can be integrated into the classroom in different ways. Um, also, you can reach a broader population when you're working in the schools. You can reach the students who don't necessarily have access to medical care, underserved youth, um, it is a place where p people know how to get there, so it's familiar and comfortable for many families, and there's potentially less stigma. Now, we were a little worried about working in the schools, talking about depression. We don't talk a lot about depression in the schools. We talk a lot about stress. We try to get away from labels that we think are going to create stigma where students might feel that they've been labeled in some way. So we try to very much normalize it because we see a lot of these problems as normal anyway. Also in a prevention context, we are working with a high-risk sample, but it's not a clinical sample. So um, we, have, we have been looking at stigma in terms of the kids who participate in our group and what they feel, and I'll present that data in a, in a little bit. Um, 
So our curriculum focuses on three target areas. The first is learning, which incorporates um, school skills as well as um, homework and improving grades. Um, you know, some of our kids are straight A students, but they might need better study habits. Some of the kids might need to boost, um, boost their grades and boost their learning. Um, our second target area is relationships. Uh, can be relationships with family, friends, or other people in the community. We do find that relationships with parents and peers is very common focus for kids in our study. And then healthy mind and body. So this is um, kind of thinking about depression and mood in the context of other behaviors that are relevant to mood, like getting enough sleep and getting some exercise and um, thinking about your nutrition because it's easy to be <laughs> depressed. I mean, a lot of the psychovegetative uh, symptoms of depression can very much relate to mood and exercise and things like these. Um, so we feel like it's, we're more effective when we can think more holistically about mind and body together. Um, so the goals of our parent component are to engage parents in the intervention process so that they aren't left out, but they are very much active participants um, and understanding what we're doing at every step of the way, providing them with a common language and understanding of the skills that we're teaching to their children, um, fostering a better parent-child relationship, trying to work on that, trying to think about the parent as a supportive person for the child. And then finally, raising parents' awareness of students' progress and goals throughout the program. Now that doesn't mean we tell them every detail of what the students are working on in the group because these are middle schoolers and they are starting to get to the age where they need some privacy and they might be working on something that is private. But they do share at least some of the goals with their parent. So um, we conducted pilot testing from 2005 to 2007, and we were in four Seattle public schools, and we screened 684 youth for depression, and 67 were included in an intervention trial. And um, outcomes suggested that the intervention students gain skills in adaptive coping, cognition, and communication. Um, but we felt like more work was, would be needed to really sort of prove the effectiveness of our intervention. So we are doing another trial, which I'll tell you about next. Um, the pilot program was well received by students and parents. 77% of the students said they felt comfortable in the group, and 84% liked it pretty much or very much. And the parent workshops were rated to be very helpful. Um, and. Um, we had 94% of parents who received at least three out of the four sessions. So we really did have um, an advantage in that we were able to go to them if, if they couldn't come to the school. Um, but we did have really high rates and the parents who did it liked it. So we did find that the stigma was actually not really a problem in the schools we were working with. Once the students got into the study and it was normalized, um, they really felt like being part of the group was very comfortable to them. So now we're moving on, we're doing the next phase, which is called the Middle School Matter Study. And we have this, these little um, bright orange bracelets we created when we introduced our study to give to all the kids to wear, which say Middle School Matters. Um, try to promote the idea that this is an important time in their life for a foundation of skills. Um, we screened uh, 1,190 students um, across four schools. We uh, did translate our forms into Spanish and Vietnamese, so this included 20 children of Spanish-speaking parents and four children of Vietnamese-speaking parents um, who participated in our screening. Um, our inclusion criteria was um, students who scored above at or above 14 on the mood and feelings questionnaire, which is a depressive symptom scale. It's very similar to the child depression inventory, except it's a little more DSM-4 based. Um, but it covers the cognitive, it covers all the symptoms of depression. And 
Um, a score of 14 or above is roughly the 25th percentile. So if you think about your bell curve, we're sort of trying to select those students who are toward the, not the far extreme, but at the higher risk level um, for depressive symptoms. Um, we excluded students who, we, we did a follow-up interview with them to determine whether we thought they might have major depressive disorder. And we excluded students who had probable major depressive disorder, as well as students who had suicidal ideation, or students who were already in treatment or in a self-contained classroom. So um, from that 1190, 242 students were eligible for our prevention trial based on their scores. Of that, 123 actually enrolled in our prevention trial. Um, you might wonder what was the extent of suicidal ideation that we observed in the sample, and it was about 2.6%. Um, so we followed up with 31 students who had suicidal ideation. We actually did include a couple of them that were at the very low level of ideation and that they had thoughts that they'd be better off dead, but they would never, ever do anything and they had no history. We did include those students in our prevention trial, but the other students we um, made parental uh, contact with and we gave them referrals to outside providers who could more um, work with them more individually around the suicidal ideation because we felt like a group protocol wouldn't be appropriate for those students. Um, so um, we're doing our intervention. We have 11 groups of students led by six different leaders at four different schools this time. Um, we are um, testing it as an after-school model at Alderwood Middle School, which is pictured in this slide. At the other three schools, which are Seattle Public Schools, we're testing it as an in-school pull-out program. So those students are being pulled out of their academic classes. Middle schoolers have six periods. So we um, pull them out of each class twice to cover the 12 groups. So they miss math twice, for example. Um, there are definite trade-offs, which we are learning, to thinking about after-school intervention versus in-school intervention. And one of the trade-offs is the enrollment rate. So at Alderwood, our enrollment rate was about 39% for the after-school program. And in the Seattle Public Schools, our enrollment rate was averaged at 59%. So we definitely capture more kids when we're doing it during the school day. Obviously, a disadvantage is they're missing some of their classwork. So um, that is an issue for some kids and some parents. We do allow them to opt out if they're having a test or a really important day. We'll make up the material with them later. But it is a barrier to thinking about doing this work more broadly, as well as um, uh, just the school schedule and how variable that is. Right now, a lot of our students are doing the um, MSP testing. So we, when they're testing, we can't be pulling them out at all, and we have to change our groups around and let the teachers know. So you know, there's sort of pros and cons each way, but those are some of the things that we've observed so far in comparing after school to an in-school model. We do have a control intervention, which is um, the MAPS, which is uh, was originally developed in the School of Nursing um, by Elaine Thompson and her group, Reconnecting Youth. So MAPS stands for Measure of Adolescent Potential for Suicide. And basically what they've developed is a one to two hour individual interview that's computer assisted and um, the interventionist meets with the student one-on-one -on -one and assesses um, how well they're doing in different areas and provides a lot of empathy um, as well as a little bit of a motivational interviewing kind of style, not, not to an extreme, but a little bit of sort of comparative, comparing you to other students in different areas your depression is this high or your stress is this high as a way to, to talk about empathy. Um, the interventionist provides social support and brief problem solving as well. So I wanted to show you some of the materials we use uh, in our groups to teach the students some of these skills to give you a little bit of a hands-on flavor for what these kinds of curriculums can look like. Um, so this is uh, a slide that we have made into a handout and a poster for students that we display in the group when we're talking about goal setting. 
and we help work with them on breaking down really big goals into smaller steps um, and think about things that are realistic and specific and desirable for their goals and try to come up with steps that they can take on a weekly basis to get closer to achieving their goals. And I'm going to um, let you listen to a little audio clip from one of our groups um, where the interventionist is going around to different students in the group and checking in on how they're doing on their goals. And the first girl, I think, is her goal is practicing her guitar. But this is sort of a general how we teach goal setting to kids, and we do check in with them. Um, it's, it's sort of embedded, I think, within a behavioral activation framework, thinking about moving forward on your goals. Um, we also have students identify barriers that can get in the way of their goals, which we call triggers and roadblocks, so that they can plan for how to address them. And throughout our curriculum, we have students incorporate both um, positive thoughts and actions to um, help them make a plan. So first, identify the thoughts and roadblocks that keep you from being successful. And then we have students make a plan for what you can tell yourself and what you can do to stay on course. Now, sometimes the action is more relevant to actually solving the problem. And other times, you know, the cognition is really important, but we try to teach them both simultaneously so because in different situations, um, they may be more or less effective so that they have it sort of as a toolbox. As well as I think that teaching them the thought, although maybe not completely necessary from a strict behavioral activation standpoint, I think it can be helpful from a motivational standpoint in terms of having the student tell themselves like, it's not so bad, or I can do this, or if I just get through, you know, I'll be all done. That it, it can provide some motivation, even if the action is really what's going to get them toward their goal. So we do teach both all the time, um, just because we feel like both are valuable skills in different situations. And as a prevention of, approach, I think it's a little different than intervention, where you might think about somebody working one-on-one -on -one individually, what are their just sort of targeting their triggers. Here we're a little more broad-based in providing a toolbox so that people can draw on the components that work for them, which might be different from student to student. Um, we have four meetings with parents. Two of them are home visit. That's, that's meeting one and meeting four are home visits. Um, and we also do two parent workshops, which we do at the school in groups of parents. Kids are not present. The first meeting uh, we do as a workshop, we talk about understanding your child's emotional development. And this is coming from a more normative, you know, understanding what's happening to these middle school minds and bodies and brains and um, emotions that are running very high. And, and it's also, I think it does provide some parental support. One of the things that parents like about the groups is coming together with another group of parents and talking about what they're observing in their kids and just realizing how normal it is, um, they've really appreciated that. Um, so we use that as a basis, and we try to do some perspective taking where we have the parents think about when they were in middle school, which is always very interesting, and, and step into their children's shoes a little bit to, to provide a basis for a little bit more empathy about, you know, it's, it is a hard time. Um, and then in the third meeting with parents, we talk more about communication skills where um, we really, um, we teach them really a three-step approach to communicating with their teenagers. And the first step is showing understanding, um, listening to what the student is feeling, reflecting emotions. It's very much sort of an emotion coaching kind of feel to it. And then we teach them that that's, in theory, that should always be the first step before you communicate your own message, you know, especially in highly emotional situations, that the first step is just sort of recognizing where your child is at. And there might be limits that need to be set, but you can be much more effective with your limit setting after you've connected with your students. So we really focus more on the connection than on the limit setting piece of that. Um, but we do address both, and we also talk about problem solving, and that this is an age where you want to start helping your student learn how to solve problems instead of you always providing the suggestions. And so we work with them, and a lot of them are seem to be 
you know, there's that middle ground where it's not clear students aren't able to solve problems on their own, but you don't want to overtake that as a parent. So for them, sort of practicing different scenarios and thinking about their role in problem solving and how, um, how they could possibly step back a little bit and help see how their students developing those skills on their own, especially since we're teaching them actively. So um, those are some of the parent meetings. Um, so some of our ongoing research questions, I, I apologize that I don't have outcome data for you today. We are literally finishing up our groups this month and our um, other interventions, so we do not have our outcome data, but we hope to have it ready to go in the fall. These are some of the questions we are trying to address ongoing. Who is at most risk of developing depression? How can we identify those students with the most accuracy? Um, what are the effects of the skills-based group intervention, which is positive thoughts and actions, versus individual support, which is the MAPS program? And that's another viable intervention. You know, it's individual, but it's shorter. So if that intervention provides some benefit, then it's a one that we want to consider embracing as well and thinking about disseminating. Are the effects of these interventions specific to depression? I don't think that's been very well answered in the literature. People have looked a little bit. There seem to be some runoff effects on anxiety, is what we're finding um, from our meta-analysis, but not necessarily to other externalizing behaviors. Um, but people haven't looked beyond like DSM kind of stuff in terms of does depression intervention help boost academic grades and relationships with parents and functioning and things like that that are like, I think, really important outcomes, even though they're not DSM axis one. Um, so that's what we're thinking about when we're saying our effects specific to depression. What else are we changing, if anything, when we do this kind of work with kids? And then what components of the prevention are the most important? I don't know that I'll be able to answer that in this research design, but I'm always wondering, we build these multi-component packages and need to better understand what's, which pieces are the most important. And of course, for whom does it work? Um, all right, so there are a couple summary points I want you to take away from today. Number one, there are many common components of effective treatments for youth depression, and this is quiz time, so we do this in our groups. Anybody can name a couple of the common components that I mentioned from our component analysis that are effective? Goal setting. Goal setting, very good. Behavior activation. Behavior activation. Cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring. Problem solving. Interpersonal or, yeah, relationships. Psychoeducation. Self-monitoring, psychoeducation. And the last one was communication training. Great. So remember those when you see the best you. Start with those if you're doing your own thing. Interventions in non-specialty settings, um, such as school, and I think also primary care, may help provide access to folks who can't make it to outpatient mental health and reduce the stigma as well. So I think we need to be increasingly thinking about those venues. Um, and then the benefits and barriers to in-school versus after-school models, if you're thinking about school-based prevention, must be weighed carefully. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's hard either way that there's different trade-offs. And I think the ideal, the ideal is if you have an in-school class like health, where you can build in this kind of a program, I think that's a beautiful model. Now, not all middle schools have health class or something that has the room for something, some content like this. So the question is, where does it go in the school day? Um, and then just, I'll just do my thank you slide and then I'll get to some questions. Um, I want to thank my team. I have a great team of people, interventionists. Heather Violet is my postdoc. She's amazing. Um, and research associates who have helped me tremendously uh, execute this work also NIMH for funding this important work um, in the schools. And the school partners, I should have mentioned the school partners as well. They have a lot on their plate. They are working very hard to, to um, do all they can in the schools and they have allowed us to work with them. So we are very grateful and appreciative of Seattle Public Schools and Alderwood Middle School as well. So I'm happy to entertain questions and discussion at this
this point. I'm sorry for the audio. I have wonderful.